Welcome to HD Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. Oh my goodness, it is a good week for Blu-rays. Excellent. It is a great week for Blu-rays, especially if you're a fan of James Dean, the 50s actor, not the porn stud. Um, it's crazy, <laughs> right? Well, you're laughing, but Rebel Without a Cause hey, is on Blu-ray. Anytime there's a good selection of new Blu-rays at good prices, I'm right Giant, there. love that movie, is cool. on Blu-ray. East of Eden is on Blu-ray, which is about enough of the whole James Dean festival. Uh, Out of the Furnace, Inside Lewin Davis, El Dorado, OK Corral, uh, The Book Thief, Samson and Delilah. There's just some crazy stuff coming out. It is a good week. Um, Tommy by the Who, which I saw when I was five, which is way too young to see that movie. Um, <laughs> Cowboys and Aliens, which has been out on Blu-ray and I don't ever want to see again. <laughs> good to know. There's just a lot going on this week. Oh, very cool. And by the way, next week, Frozen. And American Hustle. Frozen! And Saving Mr. American Banks. Hustle. I might check that out. There's so much good Excellent. stuff coming out. Excellent. Speaking of uh, good stuff that may or may not be coming out, we've been hearing rumors that Amazon will soon release a set-top box to compete with devices like the Roku, the Chromecast, and of course the Apple TV. GigaOM says the device will not only offer Amazon's instant video, but will also offer direct competitors like Netflix and Hulu Plus at launch. Notice they're not offering direct competitors like Google Play and Apple TV at launch. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon's box is expected to be Android-based, possibly support the dial protocol, the same tech behind the Chromecast, flinging from a second device experience. I am addicted to that whole second screen experience where you're just using your, using your smart device or whatever, tablet right. or phone, picking out what you want, getting it lined up, and then just having it right to the device right there. Bing. So very little interaction, but uh, it's clean, it's elegant, and I love it. And with that, hey. You're an Elliot man. <laughs> hey, Qualid seemed a bit excited when he tweeted to us, quote, next gen Blu-rays, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Disc isn't point. dead, people! <laughs> Whatever that was I just did, I'd like to apologize for. <laughs> uh, the GameSpot article he linked to highlights a Panasonic Sony venture that we've talked about a little bit before, but it's bringing something called the archival disc format to businesses by next summer. Yeah. Talking 2015 technology Haven't here. Haven't we been reading about this for like four years now? <sighs> we've seen things related to this, either at past CESs, right. demonstrations of potential 100 next-gen formats, multi-layer Blu-ray. Blu right. According to the article over at GameSpot, Panasonic has now clarified that this AD format, the archival disc format, is intended for professional purposes only and not for general consumer use. <laughs> Boo. But good for storage anyway. Now we're talking, it's a double-sided disc technology. It's going to be the same size as the discs we're used to, uh, with three layers per side, and it will initially be offered with the 300 gigabyte storage capacity that will eventually be expanded out to 500 and uh, 500 gigabytes and one terabyte at a later date. Right. That's a lot of data, and you're seeing more and more, at least I'm seeing more and more businesses using, or going to optical for right. that long-term cold storage of, of mass amounts of data, Which usually is using okay robots. as long as it's quality media and it doesn't deteriorate over time. Totally. Which has been an issue with, with burnable CDs and burnable uh, uh, DVD discs in the past. I think, though, they've got a good lock on it. It, it has been a while since I've seen outright catastrophic failures of optical media, <laughs> but it is one of those things, looking back, it isn't that long ago that yeah. you could have the same brand, and over time they'll change a formula within the brand, right. either the inks or the reflective layers or something, causing it to fail prematurely, and the, that, that the, is just kind of scary. The problem with brands of CDRs or DVDs is that almost invariably they put out a bid, the bid gets answered. They choose the least expensive bid that fits their specs, and they wrap their label around it. Or the the disc gets printed with their label, and then it wraps with their label. It's very rare. There's a lot of brands that don't manufacture their own discs, or basically just buy whatever's available from the actual manufacturers. There's only a handful of manufacturers, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Much like TV or LCD manufacturers, there's a few, but then they get spread around and rebranded to under whatever <laughs> commercial brand you're used to seeing in the stores. So. We'll talk about that in just a second. While we're talking <laughs> tweets, I want to shout out props to vigilant viewer Andrew R. who sent us a link to Torrent Freaks. This write-up, U.S. Courts <laughs> orders seizure of DVD ripping software domains and funds. Um, so it turns out it's going to be a little bit harder to find DVD fab decrypt your software, at least from Fantango Software's U.S. domain. So if I go to DVD fab... DVD fab has been making it exceptionally easy to transfer your DVDs and your Blu-rays that you own into just about <gasps> any portable format or <gasps> archival format that you need. Need. And it's hence, gone. as soon as the government finds out, turn okay. off your website. So here's what happened, right? So AACS, or the consortium behind the Advanced Access Content Systems, 
were really, really frustrated with the fact that DVD Fab was operating in the U.S. Here it is. The DVD Fab Group openly touts these illegal <laughs> circumvention <laughs> attributes of the DVD Fab software on the DVD Fab websites, advertising that, among other things, its software products remove all Blu-ray copy protections and can remove all known AACS copy protections. Um, you know, so they filed an injunction. Uh, you know, the <laughs> it really, that whole statement really depends on where you're standing in the world. Yes. And <laughs> what the local laws say. Feng Tao is a Chinese <laughs> company. They ignored the injunction. The AACS group went the next step, which is to go to a judge and said, take their bank accounts, shut their websites down. And of course, literally within probably seconds, if not before, DVDFab.com went down. Boom! DVDFab.cn is launched. Hey, get uh, your spring break on. <laughs> with a big 25% <laughs> off sale. Um, I, you know, my response was derp. But there's a reason. So in the United States, a Digital Millennium Copyright Act says it is illegal to circumvent copy protection on anything. On yeah. music, on movies, on television shows, on software, on operating systems. I'm pretty sure... Someone, you know, somewhere is going to argue that that my screws on the back of my case are copy protection. They're not. I'm being silly, but only by a little bit. Um, <laughs> barely. Barely. If there's money to be made in litigation, you're screwed. Yeah, well, it's really funny because in one sense, right, we want to operate, we, we want to honor the people that, that generate intellectual property, the content owners, the creators. We want them to get paid because you know what? Freaking House of Cards is amazing. And I want the people that made House of Cards to get paid. I mean, they, they also give it away for free for nine bucks a month with a Netflix subscription. Uh, Netflix.com slash uh, HD. Not really free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The. Uh, Netflix.com slash Techzilla. But the, uh, <laughs> but the thing the that's so funny about this is it means, you know, if, if I have a piece of proprietary hardware that requires software that is copy protected and the company goes out of business, I'm violating the law if I want to crack that software and make it usable again. If I want to repair things, if I want to use the media, I th we think we've paid through the ass for our Blu-rays and we want to distribute them around our home without paying $10,000 for one of Kaleidoscape systems. Wait a minute. People that spend a lot of money don't have to follow the laws the rest of us have to follow. This is true. Oh, my goodness. In there any case, are options available to you. And I don't want to take anything away from Kaleidoscape because their systems are really awesome. Their systems it's, rock. It's sad that you have to have the Blu-ray disc in the system to actually access the Blu-ray. That's Blu -ray what the 300 the disc server. changers are for. In any case, <laughs> we both use any... <laughs> <laughs> we both use slice off software. DVD Fab Decryptor is pretty awesome, and it is still available, and will probably be sued next week. So if we're gone, it's been a pleasure serving you here at HD Nation. Just saying. I was recently researching 4K LCD panel production. Exciting, I know. And I came across an interesting, interesting chart that highlights the diversity of manufacturers in the world and what companies are buying the panels that are actually produced. Now, there was an article up here on twice.com, a great in, uh, site for the industry at large, and there's a couple of charts at the bottom of this page that shows, basically, the two Taiwanese companies that are responsible or are expected to account for at least probably more than half of all 4K panel production. We're talking about Inelux and AUO. Wow. This, this colorful chart just simply shows you what brands these companies are shipping their panels to. And what I found fascinating about this chart is how it provides some insight into where some of the largest brands of HDTV panels are, are TVs are being sourced in terms of where their 4K panels are coming from. You could see that where in terms of Samsung here in the center is actually most of the majority of their panels are actually going to themselves, uh, if you look at the color chart here. But if you look at a company like Intellux or AUO, they seem to be pretty much agnostic in terms of who they ship to. Wow. They're sending panels to pretty much every manufacturer. So when I, when I was at CES and I wondered why TCL and Hisense were showing off some very Samsung-y looking 4K TV sets at, at identical sizes mm -hmm. and, of course, the resolutions, it now makes a little more sense in the fact that they are sourcing some of these panels from each other, right. and that's where it's coming from. However, Samsung and LG and almost all manufacturers are sourcing at least some of their 4K TVs from those brands, but if you look carefully at those, uh, especially with Samsung and LG, you'll see that they don't actually source from each other at all, which <laughs> really not a big surprise, but... I'm it's shocked. also interesting that the, the majority of the screens that are being used by these companies are coming from within. I love so. that you're seeing like Sony on every single column except for China Star. Uh, it, it, it just fascinates me to no end in terms of who's getting them. Like right. Samsung supplies some to Sony. Of course, AUO and LX are supplying to everyone. Some LGs are going to not only Sony, but also companies like Hisense and TCL. Right. And, of course, China Star's in there, too. Some of those off-brands, it gives you an idea of where the actual panel itself is coming from. And for that, it just it shows you the, the inner, inner, inner relationships between these companies in terms of how they, how they make their TVs. 
And Vizio is not listed on there. There is a chance, though, when you're looking at a bunch of TVs at the exact same size and resolution, it may be, when you're in the store, it right. may be that those panels are actually all coming from the same manufacturer in terms of the panel, and then each, manuf each, each reseller then right. is actually putting their secret sauce in and final touches on it. And that's really important because the glass, you know, it's kind of like the sensor on the camera, the glass to a television, that's just part of the quality you get. The, the, what's the, basically the software that feeds the screen, the, the firmware, the software, the, the, the electronics that feed the screen are as important, if not more important, than the screen itself. Yeah, the overall engineering. It's, it's good to have people in the back end who know what they're doing mm -hmm. so that the signals get processed right. right. You're getting the most you can out of that particular panel, one would hope. One would hope. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, the Display Pros at DisplayMate tweeted, quote, the widespread press reports that the Sony Xperia ZG triluminous LCDs have quantum dots are not correct. Oh. They don't. Follow up email from DisplayMate's president, Ray Sonira, went a little bit further saying, while some models of Sony Triluminous Bravia TVs have quantum dots, not all of them, none of the just announced Sony Mobile Xperia smartphones and tablets have quantum dots. This ambiguity helps Sony and muddles the identity of quantum dots as a unique technology. Yeah. All that aside, it, the big question is really, okay, why are quantum dots so important? Right. You know, what the heck are they? In a word, why they're important is color. Quantum dots are an engineered material that emit a very pure and very precisely colored light. Generally speaking, the larger the particle, the redder the hues, the smaller the particles created, they'll skew toward blue. Uh, you're able to create these particles in any color you want. Last week I showed you close-up pictures, actually I have one up right now, uh, of an LCD screen, and you can see the individual sub-pixels, three, a, a green, a red, and a blue sub-pixel. Actually, literally, colored pieces of plastic these are. Are, filtered, uh, are filtering a white backlight system, and that is how then this light is actually generated to create the imagery we see on screen. And right next to it, I have some actual quantum dot material actually being illuminated or, or excited and giving off a variety of different colors. Just simply by varying the size of those particles of the quantum dot material, you're able to generate whatever color you need very precisely now. The LED backlights used in today's LCD TVs are bluish with ultraviolet mixed in with it. And these LEDs incorporate a yellow phosphor that produces an okay white light that's really not as color saturated as it should be. If you're gonna be then filtering it with little plastic bits into red, sure. blue, and green, you want extra saturated color to start with. Now, take those same blue UV LEDs and add some precisely tuned quantum dot material in the front, usually embedded in plastic, and it will generate well-saturated and accurate greens and reds, and then you end up with a white light source that can deliver a more robust color palette. Now, Ooh. some LCDs used to use, and still do today, some smaller displays still use RGB, red, blue, and green LEDs clustered together to achieve a similar goal in terms of terrific color saturation, but this is a really costly way to do it. Instead of having a single LED, maybe edge lit, you're having multiple LEDs grouped together in order to create that white light. And really the bottom line is if we want LCDs to display more of the colors that we are capable of seeing, then LCDs need a better backlight system, a better white light in order to filter that out. Mm -hmm. And the QD materials are really one of the better looking things that are out there right now that are available today that could enhance this te technology that we're all using using in so many devices right now, and it apparently will be a little bit longer before things like OLED or the organic right. LED technologies take over, but to get, to get more life out of these LCDs and to get better color, uh, it's going to be required. It's basically saying all of the screens can get better. Indeed, and, and, and just to <laughs> highlight what I'm talking about in terms of color palette, I have just a quick chart here just to show that with a traditional white LED, this dashed line represents mm -hmm. the colors that are, are mathematically possible within HDTV. This is what everything encodes within that triangle. However, the, the, the colored part is actually showing what the TV is capable of. And in particular, if you can extend green out closer to where it should be, you, color, you cover more of that available uh, color space that's defined within the HDTV spec. And in a sense, you end up with a TV that can give you a more realistic picture and better better represent what the video is trying to show you. Is that information that cameras can already record or will we need to sort of update the sensors on the camera to be able to get the information to the TV at the other end of it? I, I would say most of today's cameras, I would even assume a lot of today's consumer camcorders mm -hmm. are capable of recording beyond HD quality. Some of the very high-end cameras like Sony uses in their video production, their F65 in particular, is touted as being one of the widest color capturing cameras currently available and it goes far beyond what the HD spec is but for things like movie production where you're not limited by this color, this color palette is not used anywhere else uh, except for television, usually. Uh, in movies, you have right. an unlimited color palette, as much color as that can be captured and transferred to the digital process. And for that, yeah. it's a good thing. It's just 
the way we're going to make LCDs better, and this is one way to right. do it that doesn't dramatically increase costs. It's a good thing. Hey, you want to learn more about color spaces when it comes to color grading, video production, learning kind of how things get made pretty? Check out lynda.com slash HDNation. They're our sponsor. And learn the skills you need to get ahead. lynda.com slash HDNation for a free seven-day trial. 2,400 courses up there, including some incredible stuff on video, video editing. <laughs> Video, 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 video editing. I don't think we have any video editing. The video, video, video editing. Linda.com. That's where you're in the middle of clicking something. It's like, oh, stop. Oh. Undo, we, undo. We have a wonderful <laughs> pair of emails today. Two of our loyal viewers contacted us with similar stories of how the sinister <laughs> Robert hates the HDMI to composite <sighs> video adapter, but how it helped them overcome the sometimes limited input selection on car AV systems. Specifically, they Which, mentioned both. Uh, independently of each other, they were talking about, look, I've got this car head unit, or I have the car AV system for my kids, and the only thing it offers is a composite video input, the dreaded little yellow jack or cable. And you know what? In those situations, I'm going to say that in that scenario, you need something to convert that right. HDMI to a composite cable. I'm not going to burn you for that. But in all <laughs> cases, you are, you are seriously degrading image quality. And my big question really is, where are those MHL-enabled head units or something with you know, HDMI or mobile HDMI or you know, something to provide better connectivity within, within the car audio environment, Through AV environment? <laughs> I, I suddenly want to go look at head units and see if anybody's incorporating oh, maybe, uh, maybe some sort of a, a video input that's digital on on a car. That's the scent of disappointment in Robert's I, future. I need to go car shopping. <laughs> 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 Subscribe, please. RevisionTree.com slash HDNation or YouTube.com slash HDNation. And please tell your friends. You like the show? Put a link to it in an email or on a Twitter or on your Facebook page and send it to everyone. Too true. Please. Hey, and we love it when you email us with your comments, your questions, or suggestions. Yeah. Or, hey, if you're feeling active, <laughs> post them right down below and let everyone know. And until next time, thank you for watching.